Hi, my name is Pumika and the lesson for today is going to be proteins and the urea cycle. So, uh, let's start with the simplest definition of proteins. Any class of nitrogenous organic compounds which have large molecules composed of one or more long chains of amino acids and are an essential part of all living organisms, especially as structural components of body tissue such as muscle, hair, etc. and as enzymes and antibodies are called proteins. Now, as an example, as a diagram, I have given the primary structure of a protein and you can easily see the NH2 group or the amino group onto one side and the carboxyl group onto the other side. Alright, so uh, the definition says that they are essential part of living organisms. So for muscle, we know the proteins are actin and myosin. For hair, we know it's arginine. As enzymes, we know almost all the enzymes relating to the elementary canal. They are proteins and antibodies. Pretty, pretty clear, right? All right. Uh, for the next topic, it is types of proteins based on structure. Now, the structure of proteins is basically categorized into four types. The primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary let us begin with the primary structure now the primary structure of a protein it refers to the linear sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain now uh, please mind it I'm going to write the word amino acid as an AA like so all right the primary structure is held together by covalent bonds such as the peptide bonds which are made during the protein biosynthesis now uh, let's say we have one amino acid bound by another amino acid of same or a different type or another amino acid so now we've got multiple bonds these are peptide bonds and because these are multiple we'll call them polypeptide bonds so we've got a polypeptide chain like so and this whole thing is a linear structure of course so what is it it's a primary structure the two ends of the polypeptide chain are referred to as the carboxyl terminus, which is the C terminus. We saw the diagram in the previous slide. And the other, where NH2 is present, is the N terminus. All right. The next structure is the secondary structure. The secondary structure refers to a highly regular local substructures on the actual polypeptide backbone chain. That means if a primary structure undergoes backbone interactions, then secondary structure is formed. Two main types of secondary structures are the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets. All right. If a polypeptide chain coils itself like this structure right itself um, in form of a telephone wire, it gives rise to alpha helix. Whereas a beta pleated sheet is formed when the polypeptide chain it aligns itself in this type of a zigzag position and these blue lines that I have drawn these are the hydrogen bonds okay these secondary structures are defined by patterns of hydrogen bonds which are between the main chain peptide groups and uh, precisely in the beta sheets if n and N, they are present parallel to each other, then they are known as the parallel beta sheet. Whereas if they're present onto the opposite sides, then they are the anti-parallel. All right. For the next structure, we have the tertiary structure. The tertiary structure it refers to the three D structure of monomeric and multimeric protein molecules. Now, uh, the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheet, which were formed in the secondary structure, they are folded into a more compact globular structure. This folding is driven by the following forces. The hydrophobic interactions, the burial of the hydrophobic residues from water, but the structure is stable only when the parts of a protein domain are locked into place by specific tertiary interactions, such as salt bridges, hydrogen bonds and the tight packing of side chain and disulfide bonds the disulfide bonds they are extremely rare in cytosolic proteins and the cytosol is generally a reducing environment all right uh, let's try to understand this with the help of the diagram 
now we have a polypeptide chain which is bound together like like so all right now i've drawn h2o outside as you can see so outside we've got the hydrophilic environment whereas inside we've got the hydrophobic environment so a kind of a micellar arrangement of the molecule takes place the hydrophilic ends they are outside and hydrophobic ends they are inside now uh, we spoke about the salt bridges of the and the disulfide bonds these take place in a special class of proteins which are known as the cysteines now the cysteines they have a structure like this but when they come um, in contact of an oxidizing environment that means the cytosol these H groups they get separated and a bond is formed between the two okay for the fourth structure we have the quaternary structure the quaternary structure is a 3d structure of multi subunit proteins and how the subunits they fit together in this context the quaternary structure is stabilized by the same bonds that um, the tertiary structure had been stabilized from and complexes of two or more polypeptides they are known as multimers specifically if it's a dimer then it contains two subunits trimer three units tetramer four units pentamer and polymer and so on all right the multimers made up of identical subunits are referred to with the fe prefix of homo for example a homo tetramer Whereas those made up of different subunits, they are referred to as a prefix of hetero. For example, a heterotetramer such as the two alpha and beta chains of hemoglobin. As a very vague diagram, I have drawn these, these polypeptide rings. This is the first ring, this is the second ring, third and the fourth ring. Like so. Now all these, they look very vaguely different. So this may be referred to as a heterotetramer. Now, for more of a well-defined diagram, we have got the primary protein structure, as you can see, which is linear. The secondary protein structure, an alpha helix like so, just drawn here, um, which is a coiled portion. The beta pleated sheet, which is a zigzag portion. Then we've got the tertiary proteins, that means more compact form of these two. And then we've got the quaternary structure, which is a 3D portion. All right. The urea cycle. Now we all know we ingest proteins to the diet that we consume. This protein is broken down into amino acid, which is the simplest unit. Now the essentials they are absorbed, while the waste it forms urea. Through the urea cycle, this urea is then sequestered inside the kidneys, where it is concentrated to form urine. And urine, as we know, it is eliminated from the body. All right, so let's begin with the steps of the urea cycle. First of all, the formation of carbamoyl phosphate takes place, and this process, it takes place inside the mitochondria. All right, the condensation of the ammonium ion, NH4+, and bicarbonate ion resulting in the formation of carbamoyl phosphate by the help of the enzyme carbamoyl phosphate synthase 1 present in the liver mitochondria now this requires an mg2 plus and a dicarboxylic acid which is the n acetyl glutamate and two atps are utilized during this process now the compound so formed in order to go through the next procedures it has to come into the cytosol so the next step is synthesis of citrulline the carbamoyl phosphate formed in the first step, it combines with ornithin, resulting in the synthesis of citrulline aided by the enzyme citrulline synthase or more precisely ornithin transcarbamoylase. Now citrulline, it is easily permeable to the mitochondrial membrane and hence it diffuses into the cytosol. For the next step, we have the synthesis of arginosaxonate. For this step in the cytosol, the citrulline, it combines with an amino acid, aspartic acid or aspartate, forming arginosaxonate, 
which is catalyzed by an enzyme called arginosuccinate synthase. Right here. It requires ATP, which is hydrolyzed into a monophosphate, resulting in the utilization of two high energy bonds. And again, we've got the magnesium ions, which act as the cofactors. Now, this arginosuccinate, it has to break down. So, the next step is called the cleavage of arginosuccinate. The enzyme arginosuccinase acts reversibly to cleave arginosuccinate into arginine and fumaric acid. In this fumarate, it enters into the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. And the linkage between the TCA and the urea cycle is also known as the Krebs bicycle. For the final step, arginine is cleaved. So arginine, it is lysed into ornithine and urea under the influence of the enzyme arginase. Hence, arginine is known as a semi-essential amino acid. That is, though it is synthesized in the body, it is not available for protein synthesis. Ornithine is regenerated in the step and it goes on to the cycle again, whereas urea cycle completes by the formation of urea. Ornithine and lysine are potent inhibitors of the enzyme arginase okay so let's see the whole of this through a diagrammatic process we can see the co2 and nh3 here they combine together utilization of two atps take place and a diphosphate is born and it gives rise to carbamoyl phosphate now this process as we know takes place in the mitochondria now it combines with ornithine and it forms citrulline in the presence of ornithine transcarbamoylase enzyme. Now this citrulline, it combines with aspartic acid and it forms arginosuccinate. And we know 1-ATP is used to form a monophosphate. Now this arginosuccinate has to break down into fumaric acid and arginine in the presence of an enzyme called arginosuccinase. Now, this arginine, it combines with water to form ornithine and urea in the presence of an enzy enzyme, arginase. This urea enters the kidneys where it is concentrated to form urine. And urine, as we know, it is eliminated outside the body. So, uh, that's it for this day's lesson. Thank you so much for watching my video.